Hey, hey, and welcome to the very first video edition of Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan, coming to you at the beginning of spring in the gorgeous mountains of Utah. Quick reminder to all my listeners and viewers, my new epic fantasy, In the Shadow of Lightning, is out just a few months from recording in June of this year. Uh, Pre-orders are a huge deal in my line of work, so if you're planning on picking it up, grab it ahead of time. I would hugely appreciate it. Um, You can even get signed copies from my website if that's the sort of thing you'd like to do. So, without further ado, my guest this week is author Brandon Sanderson. Uh, Brandon is one of the most prolific and successful authors working in science fiction and fantasy today, and he leads very little introduction. Um, I'm going to note really quickly that this episode was recorded before Brandon's record-breaking Kickstarter, so that is not something that we cover uh, among the topics tonight. We do talk about some really cool stuff. Uh, We talk about the overwhelming nature of success, running a massive business as a creative professional, uh, Brandon's desire to leave touring behind, and plenty, plenty more. So please enjoy my conversation with Brandon Sanderson. Brandon, what what overwhelms you? What overwhelms me? Yeah. Hmm, it's an excellent question. Like cuz I look at your career and there are dozens of facets that could overwhelm any normal person. Hmm. Um my ambition sometimes overwhelms me. The number of stories I want to tell, the size and scope of them and that sort of thing. Um that's definitely um a bit of a challenge. Um Let's see. Sometimes I get myself into situations where I'm like, wow, I have a lot to do. Um, And that can be a bit overwhelming at times. Um, You know, it depends on, you know, how this job goes. Um, It, as much as we try to plan and schedule, things don't always go according to plan and schedule. Um, Like book tours really overwhelmed me back when I did those, which I've not done for the last uh, two years and hope to not have to do in the future. But I remember one point on the Words of Radiance tour, which was 32 days, I think, where I was just physically feeling ill and nauseous on like day 24 and realizing I've still got over a week of this to go. Um, and that's, you know, getting up every morning way earlier than I want to be getting up, getting on a plane to someplace else. Um, publicists don't always plan according to the author's convenience. They plan according to what the bookstores are willing to schedule, particularly, um, earlier in your career. And this was the era where I was just becoming a bestseller, right? Like words of radiance was my first number one, um, in the adult market that didn't have Robert Jordan's name on it. And so, um, you know, getting up at 8 a.m. or something like this, or even sometimes 7 or 6, getting on a plane, um, spending an hour or two at the airport, flying somewhere for four hours, getting off, getting picked up, getting taken directly to a bookstore, starting a signing at 6 o'clock, getting done at 1 or 2 a.m., getting back to the hotel, eating the only uh, dinner I get is a hot dog from the gas station, um, collapsing in bed at, you know, 2 a.m. and getting up at 6 and doing it again. That got overwhelming. That got that got old real fast. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you're like, man, I am super happy to be on a bookstore, a uh, book tour where people are actually coming to my book signings. Um, what am I going to do? Be unhappy that I have to sign for eight hours. Oh, boo hoo. Right. Like, um, that's awesome. And, um, I'm happy that so many people want to come see me. Right. Do do you, do you maybe start out signings with like, maybe probably a little bit of a high, you see that line, you see all these people turn out with all your books in hand, like, like this is awesome. And then like a half hour in, you're like, Oh, this is going to be all night. Well, it's more like five hours in realizing that, you know, you started it like, like I would usually get there at six. Um, and then I would, uh, the signing would start at seven, but I would uh, do all the staff signings and the uh, and the stock signings 
and meet the people. The bookstore usually had people that are like super fans that they rewarded by, you know, that sort of stuff. And so kind of you start at six and then I would do a presentation usually for an hour or from seven to eight. And then at eight o'clock would start signing and I sign at about a rate of one to 200 people an hour. They, I have had signings with as many as 5,000 people. <laughs> and so um, if you run those numbers, 200 people an hour getting to 5,000. Um, granted, most of my signings were looking at 800. Um, I would say on that tour was a, was, was a pretty average number. And so 800 is if I'm going fast, it's four hours. It's hard to go at 200 an hour. Usually it's more like 150 if I'm going, even if I'm going fast. So you're looking at, you know, what one, two, and, um, so five to six hours. Um, and you've, I've already been going for two hours. And so when you get to that, that mark where you're, hand is starting to ache and you realize it's approaching 10 p.m. and I'm not even close. Um, that's, that's when it feels overwhelming sometimes, um, which is part of why I moved to doing so much on YouTube and stopped doing the, the tours because they're just physically and mentally exhausting. Um, and But at the same time, like I said, like – you get into this business hoping anybody will read your books and you go to your early book signings hoping a single person will show up. And uh, I've had my share of signings where nobody was there, right? Earlier in my career, uh, doesn't happen as often, but I mean, my reading at Worldcon in 2006 was just Eric James Stone, our mutual friend, one person in the audience. Um, <laughs> And, um, so you want to be appreciative of the people who've shown up and who want to show up to get books signed. It's really meaningful to them. And it's really meaningful to me that they are willing to do that. It's just, there's gotta be, they, that at some point it gets too big to handle. And that was probably the most overwhelming part of my career. 2019, I was on the road about a third of the year. Uh, a little over a third, I think, or right around a third. Um, no, it's just under, just under a third uh, of the year. And that was rough. Uh, three tours to Europe, right? Um, lots of touring around the uh, the country. Um, that also involved three or four trips to LA for movie deal stuff. Uh, visiting the set of the Wheel of Time and being there uh, and available for the Wheel of Time um, crew is, yeah, it's a big challenge to manage all of that. And you really want to just be telling your goofy story. Well, and I remember you and I had dinner around then. Maybe it was early 2019 because I was I was looking for input from you for a uh, for the next yeah. book. And mm -hmm. And I remember you were talking about that brutal schedule and, and Isaac was there as well. And I remember yeah. you're just kind of like, like, we don't know if we, do we need to get a tour bus? Like, what are we doing? And yeah, we and were talking about a tour bus, right? Yeah. Because um, part of the ex exhaustion is that signing, but part of it is airports are exhausting and um, it's really rough to not have any downtime because while you're flying, it's hard to have downtime. While you're in an airport running from here to there, it's hard to have downtime. And we were wondering if, hey, if the signings are going to be seven to eight hours, um, if what we do is we bring along Isaac and we have him take part of the time so that there's like a break in the middle of um, or something where Isaac is taking some time. And Brandon doesn't have to give the whole presentation himself. And then afterward, we can just get on a bus and have and have a full night's sleep. We were, we were really wondering if that was the answer. It turns out, I think the answer is the one we found, which is start a YouTube channel. Be available to the fans that way. Anyone who wants to see me and ask a question has a shot that way. And stop touring. So that's where we are right now. It is, you know, harder because people want signed copies of books, which I understand. But during this 
discussion, I will probably get through about a thousand of these. These are the Alloy of Law um, Leatherbound for uh, the Alloy of Law Leatherbound release later this year. Maybe I'll be able to get through a th- thousand of these in an hour, maybe more like 800, but still that's in, in an hour what took eight hours um, in a full tour. And I get to hang out with you at the same time. So, <laughs> Right, the multitasking. Right. For those who are just listening via podcast, I'm signing uh, pages from uh, the book that we're going to put together later this year. Yeah, that's. I, I find those kind of numbers a little wild. Do you – because because your career started off uh, reasonably similar to how mine ended up starting off where you you had some epic fantasy novels come out they did quite mm-hmm. well um yeah but but then it just there was a there was that point where it just snowballed and yeah were, were you finding yourself and i guess my original question about what overwhelms you kind of came from the fact that you are, are very well known for having a huge number of employees. You've got a big business, you lots of people work mm-hmm. for you. You've got lots of things going on. Where at that kind of young Brandon, uh, holy crap, things are going crazy. Where did your brain go? Okay, I've got to start hiring people and delegating and switching my time from lots of different lo- small things to to mostly writing. Right. It was somewhere around 2008 that I hired my first employee. Mm -hmm. Um, Somewhere around there. And that's Peter. Uh, And this just happened because I was starting to feel overwhelmed. And Kevin Anderson, um, friend of mine, I assume you know Kevin, a wonderful human being, great writer. He sat me down and said, Brandon, you need to get yourself an assistant. I can see the writing on the wall. This is going to be uh, too much for you to handle. Get an assistant. And I said, "Ah, it's a good idea. Can I afford an assistant? Um, But that was when things were starting to snowball. And you get used to the idea that that things are going to be like they were before. Um, And so... Uh, so yes, we could afford an assistant, but we didn't feel like we could yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I called Peter and I'm like, I think I can give you 20 hours a week. Uh, would you be interested in, you know, part-time you can pick up, you know, editorial. He was at Tokyo pop, uh, for a while, but he'd left Tokyo pop at that point. Tokyo pop was having its problems. Um, that was the, the difficult era in the manga, uh, cycle. You can, you can go read about that somewhere else, but uh, they were they were having some some problems and letting people go. So he was working like temp jobs, I believe, of some sort. And he's like, "Yes, that's way better than what I have going on right now. I'll take your twenty hours and I'll and I'll find something." And then it was n- only months later where we're like, "Oh, we have more than forty hours. We need you and someone else." That uh, that kind of hit us. So, yeah. Now that was was that before the Robert Jordan stuff started moving quickly or was that right about that time? So the way that my career kind of uh, happened is um, Elantris was sold in 2003 Mm -hmm. and came out in 2005. And so I had two years in there that I wrote the Mistborn trilogy where I was a pro, but nobody knew me yet, which was kind of the best of both worlds. Like I had the, uh, I had the the confidence that, okay, this is sold. I actually have a career. It may not be a long career. It may not be a well-paying career, but I am a professional novelist. But I didn't have to tour or anything, right? Um, I could just work on the books. Uh, Elantris came out, sold about 10,000 copies in hardcover over the year. Uh, my opening week I thought was a disaster. It was 400 copies. I'm like, oh, no. I'm dead. And my agent's like, ah, 400 copies, fine for a brand new author. Particularly if you just keep selling, you know, uh, hopefully you will. And lo and behold, I did just keep selling 400 a week for a good year. Uh, I don't know if that adds up to our um, to our 10,000, but that's around where we ended after the full hardcover run of Elantris, which was great. Um, we were... Like that's pr- pr- very solid numbers, but then Mistborn uh, sold less. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is this started back back in the day of the bookstore era. The death spiral was one of the dangerous things that could happen to an author. This is where your books start selling 
fewer copies. Um, Mistborn didn't sell as well as Elantris. I was like the new kid. Uh, people were buying Elantris because it was uh, the interesting new author uh, from Tor and things like that. And Mistborn not being a sequel to Elantris um, meant that more people are like, oh, I don't have to buy that immediately, right? Yeah. Um, and this is why the publishers really like uh, uh, series, but I was confident that I wanted to have a career that involved more than one series and that Elantris was not where I wanted to just be. And so, uh, but it sold less. So that meant the publisher had extra remainders they didn't ex anticipate having. That meant the bookstores returned more books than they anticipated returning. And that meant that when it came to order the next book, they all said, well, what if this one underperforms too? And so instead of ordering, you know, they'd ordered like 10 or 11,000 copies of Mistborn, uh, they ordered like 7,000 copies or something yeah. like that. Um, and this can be a self-fulfilling prophecy where look how poorly that one, you know, Elantra sold 10, Mistborn sold eight. This one sold seven because we only ordered seven. Uh, the next one, we better order six. Um, and then, you know, you can see how an author's career can... Um, this, would, again, was a much bigger deal in the day when bookstores were the primary method that people got books because how much, how many they kept on the shelf was a very big deal. Um, it's less of a big deal now when people can be like, oh, that's sold out, I'll buy the ebook, right? Um, or that's sold out, oh, Amazon will have them back in stock in three days. I'll just order it and I'll wait two extra days and it'll, get, it'll be on my doorstep. Um, but back then it was a, it was a serious, serious thing. So we had an all hands on deck meeting, me and Joshua, um, with his team, it's my agent. And we said, what are we going to do? And, uh, we determined that one of the problems was that Mistborn had a pretty terrible paperback cover. Um, so where we really had the emergency is when we saw the numbers on Mistborn 2, what was getting ordered. And we're like, oh no, this is bad. Um, and so we went to tour and said, we need a repackage on Mistborn. And they're like, ah, oh, no, this is, these numbers are fine. Everything's great. Uh, we're happy. Uh, we like the cover. We're like, no, this cover is awful. The first, uh, paperback cover of Mistborn was, uh, one of the worst covers I've ever had. And, um, good illustrator who's done lots of other, uh, fantastic work, including other stuff for me that I really like. but this, it was just a miss, um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we we leaned hard on tour and they eventually agreed to do it, but only if it were a brand new edition. Uh, this is how publishers even still think. It's like we can't admit that we did anything wrong, but maybe if we release a brand new edition where we're trying something new, that'll work. That's OK. It's not that we did anything wrong. It's just this is something new. Um, and so they were willing to do a repackage and then they released Mistborn with like um, this sort of special discounted edition. It was like five bucks instead of seven bucks or whatever. Um, and it had a big red $4.99 at the top um, and with a brand new cover that was uh, much better. Um, illustrator who does uh, Jim Butcher's covers. We got mm -hmm. uh, uh, McGrath um, to do those and... Um, good cover. It's the, it's not the current paperback cover, but it was the one right before this one. And that one sold really well. And that didn't come out before Mistborn 2 did, but fortunately people were invested enough in the series that when Mistborn 2 came out, they bought it out in about a week. Those 7,000 copies were not enough for the fans and they had to go back to reprint several times. And then the Mistborn new paperback came out and that one sold gangbusters, sold really well. And um, so everyone was super happy with that. And um, this was, uh, you know, 2007. And then um, that was when Harriet picked me to do the Wheel of Time was 2007. Um, and so... Um, my career then was kind of, uh, resuscitated by that, uh, Mistborn 3 then came out. Um, I don't think we, people knew Miss that I had done Wheel of Time. I think Mistborn 3 came out right before the announcement. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong. It could have come out the year after. It's hard to track these things. It's been so long now, but <laughs> right around there, Mistborn 3 is the first of mine that hit the New York Times list. Um, and, uh, then Wheel of Time uh, really 2008, 2009 is when Wheel of Time was happening because 2007 is when Jim passed away. 
Um, and 2008 is when I took took over. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. I, I remember being a student of yours and my 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 girlfriend, who now my wife, uh, lived just up the street from the borders in Riverwoods. Um, OK. In, in Provo. Yeah, in, in Provo. And, and you mm-hmm. were at a you did a signing there and I came to see it, it was a snowy day. There was nobody there but you and Isaac. And I, yeah. I, I showed up to talk to you for a couple of minutes and you kind of looked around and you leaned forward and you're like, I think I might be finishing the Wheel of Time. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, kind yeah. of amazing how like that go you go from that point to the current point. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's when it just it just took off, right? Uh, people are like, who is this Brandon Sanderson guy? Um, I released Warbreaker for free because it was my next book that I had coming out. I just put up an ebook of it on my website for all the Wheel of Time fans. I said, hey, here's a free book. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wheel of Time fandom embraced me. Um, and then 2009, I released the first of my Wheel of Time books. Uh, 2010 was Way of Kings. Um, and then the second Wheel of Time book, and then uh, Alloy of Law, which I am signing right now, and then um, the third Wheel of Time book, and then 2014, I think, is when Words of Radiance, that tour happened, that I hit uh, number one uh, on my own. I had hit number one in the YA field, though it's about a magnitude of um, YA, I think our sale were somewhere in the 20,000 copies range that opening week to hit number one on the YA list. Um, uh, to hit number one on the, t- the, the adult hardcover list, you need 70 to 120. Like there was one time where we barely beat Grisham. Um, and I think I had like 120 and he had like 115, um, something like that, where it was just, so it, it depends on who else is releasing and what's going on, uh, how it works for the times list. And the times list is all really much messier now that ebooks happen and do they count ebooks? Do they not count ebooks? They don't count audiobooks and it's just kind of crazy now. Yeah. So. Did you feel um when you when you were, you were going through the process, w- did you feel like huge amounts of pressure or or were you generally pretty confident that you had this with the wheel of time? Um so I had it's a mixture of both. I felt confident in my understanding of the wheel of time and my ability to do it justice, Mm -hmm. um, I felt huge amounts of pressure and stress when the, yeah, but what if you don't, right? Um, And there, it was kind of a balancing act um, in my own kind of heart. Uh, What happens if I don't? But all you can do is give it your best shot, right? And I I am, was very confident in the story once I was into it and I it was flowing and working, I knew that I could bring it in in a satisfying way. Um, but there were a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Um, not so much on the first of my Wheel of Time books, but a ton and on the third one. Everyone uh, at the publisher was very invested in making sure that that third book, uh, that, uh, that 14th Wheel of Time book worked. Had a lot of people looking over my shoulder, shall we say. I bet. <laughs> mm. Now, did you... I, I know that nowadays you get asked pretty frequently uh, the the Robert Jordan question, which is, yes. what happens if you pass away before Stormlight's mm-hmm. finished? And I know that yeah, you... you know like, my answer to that is, right? I've told you before, it's you. <laughs> you really... That's such a... That's like that answer. I know that we both laugh at that. We um, laugh at that because I haven't actually asked you if you would do it, but right. It's um, well, and it's such a weird question to ask because, yeah. mm-hmm. b- because what I wanted to ask you was like, cause nowadays you obviously handle that very question very well. The yeah. first time where you were asked it, were you ready for it? I kind of was and kind of wasn't like the first time I got asked it. Um, I had thought in my head, people are going to ask this. Uh, but I wasn't 100 percent sure how I would answer. And then people started asking it. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, they're going to actually ask it. I need to have an answer. Uh, the real answer these days is I'm hoping that that person would be Isaac. Right. Uh, Isaac is doing his own Mistborn novel. Um, and we're trying to if those who don't know, Isaac is my art director and very good friend. Uh, he introduced me to my wife. Uh, he's been doing, he did the maps for Mistborn. So he's been involved since 2006, before that, 2005, um, because he had, yeah, Mist 6 is when it came out. So he's been 
uh, working with me very closely. And Isaac has written five or six novels, six or seven novels um, of his own, um, uh, and is kind of through the journeyman stage and to the the stage where he's ready to step into the the pro thing. And so it'd be nice if he were our backup because he's very deeply involved in the company. Uh, but yeah, um, hopefully it won't be necessary, but it is something I think about, um, right? Like uh, one thing I want to do is have a really solid outline for the back five um, Stormlight books uh, because now that I'm five books in, it's where you need a good outline in case the, the, the worst case happens. Um, if I had died after writing like two, we'd just be like, we're not finishing the series. Sorry, there's eight books left. We just, it's sorry. It's a tragedy. It's just not going to happen. Now we're in a position where it could and, and should probably happen. So when, when you kind of, when, when you look at kind of this sprawling company that you've kind of created this, because you went from Brandon Sanderson, you know, fantasy author to Brandon Sanderson, multimedia corporation. Yes. Have you struggled letting go of the various pieces that you kind of by nature have to delegate to other people? Yeah, I'm. it's not hard to let go of things that I'm not... I, it's not hard to let go of anything but the writing, right? Um, like the first story I had to let go of was the original, which I wrote with Mary Robinette Cowell. Um, and it's a it's a, a story I'd had in my head for like 10 years that I wanted to write and there was never time for it. Um, and at some point I said, all right, <clears throat> I need to see if I can write an outline, give it to a friend and let them, um, you know, do a collaboration with me on it because this story is just never going to rise to the top. It's a story I think is really awesome, but my attention is so dedicated to the very series I'm doing and it was a standalone idea. Um, that I finding time for it was getting more and more difficult. So I said, okay, I'm going to let go, um, Mary Robinette and Mary Robinette is just amazing, right? She's a fantastic writer, uh, really easy to work with on the creative side and did a really great job with that story. I still think that story is stronger than I could have written it alone because of certain things that are going on. You know, I picked her very deliberately, um, and I think her strengths brought a lot to that piece, but it was it was difficult to let go, right? Uh, not difficult to let go of like when Isaac is writing a Mistborn story, because I view this as, you know, he is writing a story in my setting, but he's not using my characters, he's using his characters. Um, and that's just a completely different thing. I'm, I feel no preciousness about that. But if it's a story I've been thinking about for years and I want to write and then I have to acknowledge I can't write this, that that can be a little difficult. Yeah, oh, that's that that I feel like that's very healthy. Like I I'm I I've got a I've got an assistant for you know anywhere from you know ten to thirty hours a, a, a month. She's just kind of a virtual assistant, and she's amazing. I still haven't got to the point where I let her like you know take care of my emails for me. <laughs> like I just okay. like having my fingers in things. Uh huh. And I yeah, I, I, it is uh. That I had to let go of a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so I used to get all of the fan mail um, and respond to it all myself. And then I at least got it all and read it all, mm -hmm. um, even though I was having other people respond. And now um, it goes to the fan mail people and they bring to me the ones that they need uh, specific answers from me on. Do you, um, do you find yourself snacking while you're working? I usually don't snack while I'm working. Um, that, uh, but if I'm going to snack, it's because after I get done working, I'm like, now I deserve a snack, right? Um, so that's equally dangerous uh, health-wise. Snacking while you're working could be just super dangerous because I am in a different world. I won't pay attention to how much I'm eating or what I'm eating. Um, so I, I went through a period of probably the first three or four years of my career where I was mm -hmm. just... You know, I would start writing at about 10 p.m. with like a mm. massive bag of M&Ms next to me. And, right. And I'd finish at like four and the M&Ms yeah. were gone. And I, I, I put on like 45 pounds in those four years. Yeah, that uh, that that's real dangerous because you're in a different world. You're not, even, you know, you're not tracking time in the same way when you're writing. Um, do you still write at night like that? Like, I assume you had a day job back then or or not or no. What? 
at the beginning of my career, that was just how I operated. And and honestly, okay. that's until about three years ago, that's probably how I operated. It was really bad for me. Okay. Um, hmm. And I, I, I've struggled over the last couple of years trying to figure out what a schedule is. And, and it's really, honestly, it's only about the four, last four or five months I've started being really strict about, okay, I'm writing from, you know, about noon to five and that's my yeah. writing time every weekday. And I make mm-hmm. myself take the weekends off and mm. I don't write at night anymore, which is a little sad. I kind of like that solitary sort of, you know, the quiet of the world when you're writing at night. Right. I do miss that, but, but I think my schedule's a lot healthier. <laughs> yeah. Um, I still write at night, but, um, it is, it is my natural schedule. So it, it feels good to me. Uh, it does make, you know, relationships are different when you're on completely different schedules. Uh, my kids and whatnot, I see, you know, from three or from five until eight or whatever, but that's, I guess that's what a normal dad has, right? It's not that different. Yeah. Um, but you know. Uh, I don't see them in the mornings when they go off to school. I have no idea if my wife went on vacation and I had to get the kids ready. um, I would have no idea what to do. The past times we've done it there, her assistant has come in who is part time, her assistant, part time, their nanny um, or governess. I don't know. Uh, She gets them ready because I would have because I'm just not involved in that. Right. Um, I don't get up until uh, later in the day. Yeah, I'm sure I can learn it. But 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 why? Yes. But why? <laughs> yep. Now you mentioned kind of that the way that you kind of interact with other people changes because of your schedule. Do you think that it's mm-hmm. changed because of your level of success and level of fame as well? Uh I don't know. Um he, here's the thing. I was always the business person among my writing friends, right? Um, Shannon Hale will always be like, Brandon, stop being such an adult, uh, uh, and things like that. Like we, I get together with friends and what do I do? I talk business because I am an artist who is trained by an accountant and my mom did that to me. And that is still how I approach the world. And that's what I'm interested in. I have always been, um, in the court of, not in the, you know, I've been the adult in the room in the stuck up sort of way. Not in the, uh, not in, you know, the, not that everyone else is irresponsible. Um, but I'm always the one that's like, all right, what's my schedule? What am I writing right now? What am I working on? What are you working on? Hey, can we talk about this thing in the business? And that's how I've always been. I acted like I was a bestseller long before I was a bestseller. Um, And I mean, this might be a question for you, right? Like you met me in 2006, right? Um, And so you've known me since just after Isaac knew me. Um, My guess is that I was acting like this even back then. But um, I don't know. I mean, my perspective is very poor because because young Mm -hmm. Brian was extremely shy. And I I really struggled with talking to people. I remember, I remember having been in a gaming group with Dan Wells for like two years and then mm-hmm. seeing him at a convention and being a little scared to go up and talk to him because he was in author mode. Um, mm. And, yeah. and I, I always struggled with that. Uh, when I first moved to Utah a few years ago, uh, gosh, it was like five or six years ago now, um, you and I went and grabbed some, some dinner. And I remember like... I was, you, you said something about, oh, do you have my cell phone number? And I thought in my head, I literally went, you're too famous to give me your cell phone number. <laughs> like, and, and you're mm. like, oh, you're my friend. You can have my cell phone number. And yeah. I, I, I've always found that kind of mm. relationship with fame and even kind of that quiet author fame, which isn't nearly as yeah. big as, you know, movie star or anything like that. But I, I've always yeah. found that kind of intimidating from the outside. And I have kind of been the reverse. I have just walked the walk. Like I have, I have, this is, this relates back to how I was in college, right? Where I, I was the guy among the friends who had written 12 novels. And I was the guy who was like, all right, we're going to conventions and meeting editors. Come on. Um, and I was the guy that was doing all of that. Like I said, I'm I'm a, I'm an artist who is trained by an accountant, um, and so I've never had um, 
um, imposter syndrome mm-hmm. because I had those tw- those 12 books, those early years to just get used to the idea that I really am confident in my writing. I'm confident in what I want to do. Um, I know if I never make it as a writer, I'm still confident in my writing that this is what I want to be doing. Uh, and that was very liberating to me. Um, having a career is not guaranteed, but I could make my writing, I could be confident in my writing. Um, and so I've always had that kind of, uh, confidence, um, about what I'm doing. And so I would guess that it hasn't, but you'd have to ask other people. Um, right. It's, it does change things in that now that I'm a CEO or whatever, and I have a company, I have, I have employees that I, I often have employees that I haven't met because they're, you know, Kara has hired them. That's um, so weird to me. <laughs> yeah. They're working in the warehouse and they'll show up to something and I'd be like, Oh, hi. Uh, person I don't know. And they're like, yeah, I work in the warehouse. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. I mean, they're part-time or or seasonal, but still, yeah. I have employees that I haven't met. Uh, not right now. I think I've met all the ones we have right now, but when they gear up to you know, release for a Kickstarter or something, and that is odd. That changes my relationship. Meeting people for the first time as their boss that they've never met before is, uh, or they probably have, They've probably met me in a signing line or something like that, but you know what I mean. Um, That that does change things. But at the same time, um, I'm not the one hiring them or things like that. I'm just the guy writing the checks, so. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Do you feel like kind of looking back at your career so far, do you think that you've, do you think you've made any missteps that kind of, even small ones that kind of changed the way you thought about being a public person uh, or a business person or an author? Uh, I think that in the early days of the internet, um, almost everybody who was on the internet was not aware of how much reach the internet could have. Um, Like one of the very first blog posts um, I put on my website back in way back when was like uh, how Tolkien ruined fantasy was like the title. It was like total clickbait before clickbait existed, because if you read it, it's like Tolkien was so great that this genre struggled to keep up with the to catch up to him for 20 years. And so it was kind of this premise of um, he cast a long shadow. Um, It wasn't Tolkien ruining fantasy. It was Tolkien was legitimately 20 years ahead of his time. And so the entire genre really struggled to figure out what fantasy, what being a fantasy author meant in the post-Tolkien or early post-Tolkien era. But even to this day, I'll run across people who'll be like, yeah, Sanderson hates Tolkien for some reason. I can't, I, I don't know why it is. It just, it becomes its own thing that, you know, that essay, um, like I think it, it's now, that was probably 2004 four or something like i think i published it before posted it before i even published my first book um so an almost 20 year old essay that probably hasn't even been on my website um that's like seven redesigns ago and who knows if you can even link to it i'm gonna bet not um is still a thing that occasionally shows up in disco course you know sanderson hates tolkien um and so it and you see Fortunately, I didn't make insensitive tweets to try to be jokey jokey um, like a lot of it's catching up to a lot of people. But that era, 2002 to 2010 ish, we had no idea. It was just like some new toy we're playing with in the Internet. It's like, hey, look, you know, uh, I can I can put this thing up. Um, And then you aren't realizing that 20 years later, that is still what you're being judged upon in uh, in small ways. So I don't think that like a terrible thing but i do think it's uh like a lot of us from that era we didn't know what we had in our hands and uh we maybe used our powers for uh for the wrong purposes in some cases (laughs) did you um so we talked a little bit about kind of the uh like all the youtube stuff you've been doing the last couple years trying to kind of fill that void with both covid and with not touring and all that stuff yeah um but you've always been really good with kind of community engagement you know you've been doing like reddit amas for for forever um i think i was the first fantasy reddit ama 
Um, you, you, you might have been, and I, because I, I remember asking a question before I was, you know, even had an agent. Um, yeah, you know, long time ago. Uh, yeah. But but you've always been good at that. Is is community engagement something that you do because, or that this might be a leading question, but is it something that yeah. you do because it's part of your job or is it something you do because you genuinely enjoy it? Um, well, though, that is a, an interesting way. It's probably a false dichotomy. I, there's probably a multitude of other reasons. Um, it, it's a good yeah. question. Um, but let me see if I can parse it. Um, I think it is part of the job. Um, I don't think it's an essential part of the job, but I do, I came out of wheel of time fandom, right? Like that's one of the things that I was involved in when I was younger, not super, super involved, right? Like, but I had read dragon mount. I had read the forums. I had spent time talking about the wheel of time and whatnot. And I knew how frustrating it was in the dark ages of the nineties when there was no internet and no one knew what authors were doing to just try to figure out when the next book would be out and how many would be in the series was just, it was arcane and obtuse. There are entire, you know, arguments you'd have with your friends about how many books are going to be in the series. It's six books. No, I heard it's eight books. No, right here. It's a proposed nine books. Yeah, but that's the book club edition. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just writing in their publicity material. Um, and not having a direct line to the author um, was made everything a lot more obtuse. And I remember those days and don't want my fans to have to deal with that. Um, and even during the internet era, there are a lot of authors that it's uh, very difficult for them to keep fans updated uh, because of just the way that they approach their writing. Um, and this isn't a bad thing. This is just how it is, right? Like, um, I happen to be an outliner. I happen to be a very little by little day by day worker. But some writers are binge writers, right? They don't know when they're going to sit down to write the book. Um, they just know that it plans and plans and eventually it bursts out and then they have the book. It's so much harder for them to do what I do, right? I can be like, hey, I'm working on this now. I anticipate it be done this date. Here's my progress so far. Um, if you're a binge writer, you're like, it's it's still um, gestating. Uh, it might do this for another four or five months until I feel ready. And then boom, I'll write it. It could be another couple years. Who knows? I might write something else in between. Um, that sort of thing makes fans i think they would rather know but it can be more frustrating and if fans get frustrated with you then you're less likely to do continue doing that outreach and the way that i write books is just naturally works very well for keeping fans informed so i have a positive feedback loop instead of a negative feedback back loop um i do it because it's part of the job i do it because um i appreciate the fans um i do it for a break from the other things i'm doing uh, is it something I enjoy? Well, I mean, the thing I probably would enjoy most is sitting and playing video games all day and not doing any of this, right? Uh, that's not terribly fulfilling. And so I have a mindset and like an emotional makeup that makes me seek fulfillment, um, not just what I necessarily enjoy the most. So I don't play video games all day, but, you know, that would be the most fun. <laughs> I'd, I'd totally, I'd totally do that. Like that's the, that's the danger of being self-employed. It's like, I could take the day off and just play, you know, whatever I want to play. Oh, Elden Ring is out. You say, well, I could just play that all day for three or four weeks. Yes. I and then there's another cool one out. I could play that. And you know, this is a, uh, this is a dangerous road to start down, but so the question of what do I enjoy is maybe not the right way to phrase it. Right. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Now with, with dragon steel and this kind of big multimedia company that you've kind of created, you're doing, you're, you're now working with other writers a ton. Like you've got, uh, you've got co-authored books coming out. Mm -hmm. is, is this kind of, you, you had kind of mentioned earlier, your sprawling ambition is yeah. this part of your sprawling ambition? Do you see Dragonsteel continuing to grow and change and get bigger? 
is this is more a test the waters and see what I think of it. Uh, this isn't part of the ambition. Um, this is an experiment to see what my fans think and if I like the process. Um, most of these grew out of uh, when um, out of Audible and Recorded Books, which are the two big audiobook companies, coming and saying, "Hey, we're really looking for audio originals." Uh, what do what do people have? And this this started maybe five six years ago. Uh, they started to push for audio originals, and they're like, "We've got a, some budget for some of these. Um, do people want to create some audio originals?" And that's where I'm like, "Hey, I've got this idea for um, a story. I don't have time to write it, but maybe with one of my friends." And so I created a company to do audio originals just to test out this space in this market um, and see. Um, they were half things that I came up with uh, that I didn't have time to work on because I've dead, had so much to do with the Cosmere and half continuations of series people have been asking for other entries in that I felt like I had told my story and then kind of handing the world off to someone else um, so that fans could have more in that world. Uh, those were kind of the two different experiments we're doing and we're still in the middle of those, right? Uh, we have Stephen Bowles and uh, Jancy Patterson um, kind of working on two of my series um, that, like, uh, Steelheart, I'm done with, and Steven's kind of taking up and using some of where we're collaborating, but he's doing all the writing, and I'm brainstorming with him, he's saying, here's where I take the world, here's what to do with these characters, that sort of stuff. And Jancy's doing the same with Skyward. Um, though the, the Skyward ones we did were kind of in, in between books. Uh, they were novellas in between books. And this is just... Me trying to see, hey, do I enjoy this? Um, I don't have aspirations of becoming um, what's his name that co-authors all his books. Um, uh, I mean, there's name? a bunch now. Like Clive Cussler yeah. is doing it. Clive Cussler um, does does a lot. Yeah, um, I'm thinking that one guy who uh, wrote one with uh, President Clinton, um, uh, <laughs> Patterson. Right, um, right, right. Um, uh, who he's turned into James Patterson is, uh, is an interesting case because he's more editor than he is author these days. Um, he's like his own imprint and he brainstorms with the authors and things like that, but he doesn't do much of his own writing anymore. I could be wrong. I don't want to put, uh, words in James Patterson's mouth. You know, he, he's fully capable of, of doing that himself. I don't have aspirations to doing that though. Um, more it's like, Hey, let's try this thing. Let's try this thing. Um, let's see what happens. Um, a lot of this is my attention being focused a little more on the Cosmere as I'm trying to get, uh, Hollywood adaptations, uh, off the ground for things like Mistborn and Stormlight. Um, and so my, I have less attention left for ideas that aren't in the Cosmere, but they're still cool ideas that I'd like to see done. Uh, mm -hmm. and so there's the only person who's writing in the Cosmere is Isaac. And that's because Isaac has been collaborating in the Cosmere forever. And, uh, he's really just wanted to write a book in this born world. I'm like, well, and that's less me saying, here's my deliberate decision to expand the Mistborn world. And more me saying, yeah, Isaac can write in the Mistborn world. He's been there from the beginning. Um, I wish him the best. I've even told him he could publish it without my name on it. Right. Um, it could just be uh, a Mistborn book written by Isaac because, and I don't know what he'll eventually decide how to, how to approach that, but, um, you know, the Stephen Erickson's the Malazan, um, yeah. Malazan is kind of a shared world that two people write in. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go that Esselmont, far. Right? What's that? It's Esselmont, right? Is the other yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go that far to say it's a shared world um, because, you know, I did come up with it and then I brought Isaac on board. But it's more that sort of thing where it's like Isaac is allowed to play in this sandbox uh, if he would like to. Yeah. And if fans, fans enjoy it, I can totally see him doing his own series uh, in the Mistborn world or in the Cosmere that uh, that just, you know, is there because it's a cool book series for people to enjoy, not me expanding the brand. Me expanding the brand right now is really focused in uh, a couple of things. One, it's focused in our premium editions of our books. Mm -hmm. And two, it's focused on um, m working very closely with the film uh, and television people. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. It's fun with the Isaac stuff because Isaac and I, back in college, Isaac and I used mm -hmm. to meet up and write together. Uh, oh, and yeah. 
Uh, we just would sit in some like corner of some building and on our laptops and, and write and then talk about what we're working on. And it was always so much fun. And it's so cool. I would love to see him do stuff. Were you in the class the year that Isaac was in or were you in the year before? I think you I took might it have multiple met him. times. Yeah. You, what's I think, that? I think I might have met him in your class. Did you um did you take the class the year that I had to team teach it? Do you know that whole story? Yes, that was the first year I was there. That was the year. Okay. So Jancy was the year before where I didn't team teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just handed me the class to teach because uh, Dave had moved away and um, they were having trouble finding someone to teach it who had credentials. Um, they had had a guest teacher come in who was a good teacher but didn't have uh, the publication credentials or the um, – the university credentials. He didn't have a master's. Um, so they were worried about that. And so they were going to cancel the class. And Sally Taylor, one of the professors at the time, came to me and said, hey, Brandon, you should take this over because you have a book deal. It's right after I got my book deal before my book was out. And so I'm like, sure. Um, I was getting a master's degree at the time. Um, I'm like, they can't uh, they can't say I don't have a master's degree. They're giving it to me. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and, uh, and take this class. And so I taught it for a year. And then the next year, the department's like, hey, wait. This is a this is a, a creative writing class. All of our pro- English professors want to teach creative writing classes. I don't know if you know how this goes, but everyone has to slog through the non-creative writing classes, and the creative writing classes are like the fun ones to teach. Right? You don't yeah. want to have to teach tech writing to people in the chemistry department, but that's like the work you do in order to earn having the fun classes. Kind of. Um, I'm I'm simplifying and exaggerating, but basically, right. people are like. Why is this guy without even a master's degree yet? He hasn't graduated yet. Teaching a creative writing class, the most coveted classes that we that we have, and they're like, "We'll we'll do something about it." And they came and said, uh, "We're we're concerned about this." And Sally's like, um, "He has a publication history. You don't have anyone else on the department who's published science fiction and fantasy. You need to let him teach it." And they're like. But, but, but she's like, all right, how about I team teach it with him this year so that, you know, until he gets his master's degree um, or whatnot, and then he'll have the accreditation and things like that. So that was the year that Sally taught with me, Sally Taylor. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she was awesome. She was a big advocate for all of this stuff. And so that's the year you took it. That's the year Isaac took it. Um, uh, that's the year that Heather took it, who was my girlfriend at the time. Uh, she took my class, which uh, was another thing. It was a, it was a good year for your for one's girlfriend to be like, "Hey, guess what? I signed up for your class." And I'm like, "Heather, that's a conflict of interest. You can't sign up for my class." She's like, "What? It's going to be fun." I'm like, "No, you don't understand. You can't take my class." But it was the year that I had a team teacher, so I yeah. went to the department. And I said, "Ah, uh, my girlfriend signed up for my class. What do we do?" And they're like, "Ah, uh, have uh, have Sally grade her her stuff. You'll be fine." Um, oh, don't man. have it happen in future years. Um, yeah. so, so that, that was funny. Um, that's very funny. Um, yeah. so I know that we only have another moment or two of your time, mm-hmm. but I like to wrap up each of these episodes by asking everybody something out of left field, which is what's the last meal you ate that blew your mind? Last meal that I ate that blew my mind. Wow. What a weird, interesting question. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I've eaten a lot of, of really interesting and great meals, um, I don't know that it's mind blowing, but, um, I really liked, uh, the Chinese food at shoots and Provo at shops, of the Riverwoods. I've been looking for a good Chinese food restaurant. They had a, they had a good Chinese meal. It's been, it's a little hard to find ch- good Chinese food. I found in the, the Utah Valley area. Um, yeah. the last one that, that really just knocked my socks off. Um, I had a really nice meal at the Lincoln center restaurant on Manhattan, uh, that was pretty fantastic. Uh, it knocked my socks off. Uh, it was really, really good. Um, but, um, I mean, I've had a lot of really great meals along those lines, like Salt Lake. Every time I go to Valters, I don't know if you've eaten at Valters, but Valters is my favorite restaurant. And I, man, I have um, once it was, yeah, very good. The, the food at Valters just always, always impresses. Yeah. That's good stuff. I like that. Mm-hmm. That was author Brandon Sanderson. Thanks again to Brandon for coming on to chat. Please support Brandon's books and all of his projects. And of course, please support me. Pre-order In the Shadow of Lightning from your favorite bookstore. And if you're enjoying the podcast 
and want to see more of these videos, throw a couple of bucks towards Page Break over on Patreon. Mm -hmm.